Welcome to our keynote lecture of the third part of the uh, Drugs Gender City conference series that we have um, in Bordeaux since uh, last fall. Um, I'm very happy to welcome and introduce um, our keynote speaker, Emily Nichols. Emily Nichols is a um, lecturer in sociology at York University. So, um, as I said, huge thank you to everyone. And um, so what I'd like to think about in today's talk is the ways in which drinking, gender and class intersect um, in our understandings of respectable femininity and girliness in nightlife spaces. So I'm going to draw on some data from um, interviews that I conducted in Newcastle in the UK um, and think a bit more briefly at the end about my more recent work. Um, and today we'll be focusing on how do gender and class intersect in women's drinking practices and the ways that they embody girliness on a girl's night out in Newcastle. So in terms of the structure of the presentation, I'll start with um, some context to the nighttime economy. So we'll think a bit about the history of drinking, um, gender and femininity, and the ways that drinking has changed from a sort of man's game to a practice that is encouraged for both men and women. Um, we'll also think more specifically in the second section about the nighttime economy in Newcastle in the UK, where I conducted the research. Um, then the main parts of the presentation, really, I want to think about three distinct themes. I want to think about doing girly on a girl's night out, undoing girly, and then finally kind of redoing girly. Um, so um, then I'll conclude with a bit of a summary and some thoughts for further discussion. But let's start with a bit of context to gender, drinking and the nighttime economy. So we know that traditionally women's drinking was depicted as a threat, as a threat to their health, a threat to their safety, but perhaps most interestingly, a threat to their feminine, femininity, a threat to what it means to be feminine, particularly when women drink in public or become visibly drunk. So to provide a little bit of theoretical background very briefly, my starting point here is this idea that gender, in contrast to our biological sex, is socially constructed. So our gender is not something that is natural or inherent or something that is biological, um, rather it's um, something that we have to perform or enact or do in certain situations. So our gender is a set of traits, practices and behaviours that we have to embody if we want to be read as male or female. So in order to be read as male or female, we have to embody the traits associated with masculinity or femininity. So there's these characteristics that are seen as appropriate displays of behavior for, for men and women, as many of us will be very aware of. Um, so traditionally, in terms of appropriate ideas of femininity, one was expected to embody traits such as passivity and restraint, um, and to have maintained control over the body and be caring and nurturing. These kinds of ways of thinking about femininity also confine it to the domestic sphere. So women are associated with motherhood, with the home and also with the lack of having a kind of active and desiring sexual identity. So clearly, clearly being loud um, and visibly intoxicated and losing control of the body, um, particularly in public space, undermine those ideas of femininity and can be seen of as a threat to what it means to be feminine. So linked to this then, drinking in certainly within the UK, but more widely as well, has been positioned historically as a masculine pastime. So in the UK, associated with pubs and working man's clubs in a kind of industrial environment where um, drinking beer in particular was bound up with masculinity. However, what we saw in the UK um, was after the decline of heavy industry in this country, a move to kind of regenerate UK city centres by transforming them into 24-hour cities. So the idea of the 24-hour city is, of course, that consumption can go on longer into the evening and into the night, so after shops close. So I think the idea of the 24-hour city in the UK 
was around having this kind of late night cafe culture, you know, this mixed space where lots of different activities could continue into the night and people could feel really included. Um, however, the reality of the nighttime economy in the UK looks quite different. Um, we could argue that what we've seen instead is a kind of rise of um, drinking and clubbing. So Shaw argues we shouldn't really call this the nighttime economy. We should just call it the booze economy or the beer economy. So this idea that um, what we're seeing in many UK city centres is city centres with a number of mainstream bars and clubs, including big chain venues. Um, so we could say that this isn't really a very positive development, but on the other hand, at least women were getting more access to these spaces. So as these nighttime economies developed, women were more able to access and use these spaces. At the same time as these spaces developed, um, around the 1980s and particularly the 1990s, the alcohol industry started to really target women as a particular market. Um, I don't know how much international residence the example of Lambrini will have, but certainly in 1994, Lambrini um, really marketed itself as a drink for women. And the phrase, girls just wanna have fun, became their kind of catchphrase. So in these examples from Lambrini in 1994, you can see a very heteronormative kind of representation of gender and drinking through, you know, men and mascara both run at the first sign of emotion, for example. So this real targeted marketing of women. And, you know, just as a side note to say that that has not gone away, far from it. So we um, now see alongside this really kind of targeted marketing at women that has continued um, on into the 21st century. So uh, pink gin that I have here on the side, another big example in the UK, this kind of particular feminization of the spirit of gin, um, and also the marketing of wine, particularly as a drink for women. And here you can see an example of tying into Mother's Day in the UK to say, you know, say thank you to your mum with a bottle of wine. So this gendered marketing may have sort of really took off in the 80s and 90s, but obviously continues today. And then our final point to consider here then is, you know, as these spaces develop then, could we argue, uh, and I think that actually the speakers this afternoon all touched on this a little bit as well, could we argue that the nighttime economy is becoming feminized, right? So are these spaces that can be empowering and liberating for women? However, and again, as our speakers have touched on, when we start to think about, for example, issues around risk and safety for women in the nighttime economy, we might want to challenge this idea that these spaces could be empowering. So we do know um, that participating in the nighttime economy is important for many young women in the UK and more widely. And it gives women opportunities to socialize with friends um, and to relax and to unwind. Uh, we know that in the UK, women's drinking increased in the 21st century and alcohol does play an important role in doing friendships or offering escape and time out. There's even, as, we, as people have touched on again today, a suggestion that drinking can be empowering, empowering and liberating for women, giving them opportunities to redefine what it means to be feminine, to rewrite sexual and gendered scripts and challenge gendered power relations. In this way, consumption becomes a way to do gender. And this ties into post-feminist arguments. So again, this has really come across in the presentations earlier today, the idea that women are able to pursue these new feminine identities that may be pleasure-seeking, confident and assertive, um, and that this ties into their participation in drinking and clubbing. However, and as Jenny said in the introduction, I've always really thought about gender and class in my work. And we need to ask, you know, how empowering and transgressive are clubbing and drinking for young women? And importantly, are these kinds of post-feminist identities available to all women? So historically in Western contexts for women, being respectable is also bound up with being white, with being heterosexual and with being middle class. 
and it has always been more difficult for working class women to lay claim to respectable feminine identities. So here in today's presentation, I'll be drawing a bit on this idea of othering. So othering allows dominant groups such as the middle classes to establish their own identities through devaluing other groups. So in this case, um, what it means to be respectable and middle class and feminine is defined through positioning the bodies of working class women as excessive or vulgar or tasteless or out of control. And as we'll touch upon in this presentation, being really drunk or being unfeminine with your drinking practices is often labeled in particular ways as working class behavior. So, just to think a little bit today, I think it's interesting in the, in the presentations earlier, we've obviously in some senses um, thought a little bit outside the mainstream sometimes, particularly looking at rave culture, for example. Um, but what I'm interested in here is what we might call the mainstream nighttime economy. Um, so there's a small but emerging body of literature focusing specifically on a girl's night out with female friends. Um, however, this area requires further research and it's limited despite what it can tell us about femininity and friendship. So part of the reason I might, would argue that the girls' night out has been neglected in research is that the mainstream nighttime economy has also been neglected. So let's define both of those concepts. Firstly, what is a girls' night out? Um, I'm not sure how much this concept translates beyond a British context, but certainly within the UK, um, although women take part in nightlife in a variety of ways, the girls' night out is a night that involves a group of female friends who meet at one group member's house to pre-drink, so to drink before they go out and to get ready. Now, this process of drinking and getting ready is a central, important and quite lengthy part of the night. Some of my participants described it as the highlight and the best part of the night. Um, this getting ready is followed by a trip into the city centre to attend mainstream bars and a club. And importantly, the female friendship group stays together for the duration of the night. So um, Gemma also touched on this in her presentation. She said that in the 1990s, we saw research in the UK into, for example, the culture of rave girls. So we know that research in the 90s in this, in this country tended to focus on underground rave and clubbing subcultures. And these kind of subcultures were often positioned you know, by party goers, but also sometimes by researchers as authentic and empowering compared to the mainstream. So the mainstream has often been devalued in research. So the mainstream can be characterized by bars, pubs and clubs they oft that often play chart-based music and ta target a narrow and young consumer base. Importantly, the mainstream has quite normalized expectations um, that are very gendered around how people dress and very heterosexualized patterns of interaction are normalized as well. So as we discussed a few slides ago, when the nighttime economy started to really develop in the UK, this type of venue, this mainstream venue became very popular and you can see some very famous UK examples on the slide here. So we saw a number of independent venues being pushed out and replaced by these large chain bars and clubs that are often owned by major corporations. So what I would argue is going to these kinds of mainstream venues is an important part of a girl's night out for many young women. So we do need to understand more about how they make sense of their experiences in these mainstream spaces. So building on this, let's turn to the specific location for my own research. So my research takes place in Newcastle upon Tyne, which you can see um, on the map there in the corner of the slide. So Newcastle is a relatively small city in the northeast of England. Um, now it has a past that is shaped predominantly by heavy industry. So it was a shipbuilding city. And when we saw the decline of industry in Newcastle, authorities attempted to kind of rebrand or reinvent Newcastle as a party city. So there was lots of investment in Newcastle's nighttime economy to try and make it an attractive city for students for stag and hen parties and for tourists looking for a good night out. So despite this idea of kind of the glitz and glamour of Newcastle, it can be seen of as, as a city of extremes. 
So despite this rebranding and despite the high student population, it also has a strong sense of regional, regional identity tied to its former industrial past and also real pockets of poverty and deprivation as well. So Newcastle itself has a condensed city centre with distinct areas for going out. Um, and I just had I have a little map, very basic map skills here, um, a map that I made for my PhD, where I grouped the different areas of the city's nighttime economy according to my participants. So the area that I really want to focus on today is this area two. Hopefully you can see it um, on, on the map. And this is the, the big market. Um, and the big market is a kind of infamous and notorious part of Newcastle. So a street of late night mainstream bars described as cheaper and rougher than other parts of town. So traditionally, the big market was regarded as the site of kind of local working class and male dominated drinking cultures. So the big market is perceived to cater to a generally kind of working class local crowd who are also thought of often as older than um, others so the you know the the younger cash rich consumers and students of the nighttime economy are imagined as avoiding the big market and you can also see from the map area four which borders right onto the big market here and this is a smaller part of the city center called collingwood street um, locally at the time of my research it was known as the diamond strip and immediately when you think of diamond, you think of ideas of wealth and status. Um, and the diamond strip was really marketing itself as a space of upmarket, classy cocktail bars and small clubs that was much more targeted at students and young people. So when I did the research, there was a lack of pay to enter clubs, but these kinds of upmarket bars, they very often had door staff and they very often had um, dress codes as well. And the drinks prices were much more expensive here in the Diamond Strip. Um, so this was a very popular and lively part of town. Um, so the reasons that I've introduced both the big market and the Diamond Strip will become clear as I start to talk about the findings from the research. So turning to the Girls' Night Out project then, um, as Jenny said, this is what, what I looked at for my PhD, uh, this project around negotiating femininities. So this was a three-year project based in Newcastle, and I undertook 26 in-depth semi-structured interviews with women aged 18 to 25 who went on Girls' Nights Out. So I was exploring their understandings of the boundaries of femininity and the way these boundaries are negotiated through their practices on a girl's night out. And particularly, I was interested in the types of gendered and classed identities that are enabled or constrained as a result of their practices. Um, so um, participants were recruited through a range of methods, including presentations at universities and colleges and promotion on Facebook and snowballing. And the interview schedule was based around me asking, tell me about a typical girls night out and then asking them to discuss femininity. Where are the boundaries of femininity on a night out in relation to what you wear, what you drink and how you manage risk in these spaces? So the nighttime economy is a space that is complex and contradictory for women. And I wanted to explore some of those tensions. I wanted to understand what their stories about clubbing and going out can tell us about their social worlds and about femininities more widely. So I just wanted to touch on the class background of my sample as well here. Um, so my sample was diverse in terms of um, age, sexuality and class background. Um, and here I'll be talking about class, but also about participants that were local or not local to Newcastle as this is relevant. So half of my participants were from Newcastle and half were, were not local. Um, so interestingly, whilst I'm not saying that being local is the same thing as being working class, my participants who identified as working class were much more likely to be local. So 75% of all of my working class participants identified as local to the area. 
90% of my middle class participants were from outside Newcastle. So they were usually in the city because they were studying at one of the two universities there. So of my local working class participants, several identified as Geordies. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with the Geordie, this is a regional working class identity that is specific to the city of Newcastle. Um, being a Geordie is associated with a strong sense of local pride and a sense of community, and it's a kind of positive identification um, for uh, working class local people in the city. However, Whilst it can be seen as positive for those who claim it, the identity of the Geordie is kind of mocked and belittled in more widespread media representations. You might be familiar as well with the stereotype of the Essex girl, this kind of demonising of particular regional Id British identities. Um, so the Geordie woman in mainstream media is depicted as out of control, hyper-feminine um, and over-sexualized. She wears revealing clothing and heavy makeup and she drinks too much and she parties too hard. Um, and the TV show Geordie Shaw, the reality television show, um, which you can see represented in the bottom left um, image here, um, really represents that kind of image of what it means to be a Geordie woman. However, we don't know very much about how Geordie women themselves might negotiate, resist, reject or embrace these kinds of representations. Um, so what I'm going to be arguing in the rest of the paper is that for working class young local Geordie women, it may be particularly difficult for them to manage the tensions around drinking and drunkenness and for them to display feminine identities that are seen as respectable in the nighttime economy. So on to the first theme that we'll be exploring in our findings today. The first is around doing girly. How does drinking and going out with female friends enable women to embody girly identities? So interestingly, um, I just wanted to say as well, thinking about the, the, the wider themes of the, of the conference, my participants didn't really talk about the use of drugs aside from alcohol in the interviews. So um, there was a real focus, and this might be because they didn't feel comfortable telling a researcher about it, um, or it might be that alcohol was the main substance that they used in these spaces. Um, so just to start by saying uh, nights out with girlfriends were important for almost all of my participants. So sometimes um, some one participant described them as the center of my world. Um, and as Nicole says here, talking about a girl's night out, the important part is to get together and be able to talk. And when you've had a bit of a drink, you can talk freely. There's some things you tell your friends, you might not necessarily tell them if you haven't been so drunk. So what we see here is that drinking allows the women to build on and consolidate friendship. So this idea of talking openly, of lowering inhibitions. And we know from work by Jane et al, um, that drinking can be a way to establish intimacy and closeness. Um, and they use the term emotional talk to talk about that close emotional interaction that participants get when drinking. Um, Pre-drinking at home, so drinking at home before going out, was also important for a number of my participants. So whilst pre-drinking could be a sort of practical way to save money, this was not the only value that it had. So pre-drinking was about strengthening friendship bonds and was about drinking in intimate, relaxed spaces. Um, so it might be more difficult once women got to bars and clubs to have this kind of intimate talk. You know, the talk might be disrupted by music, limited space to sit, unwanted attention from um, cisgendered men in those spaces. So away from the public spaces of the city centre, pre-drinking felt like, my participants said, time to ourselves and a little private party. So behaviour would not be policed or judged by others. Um, and this was a kind of safe space to drink and let your hair down. So this might be the role of drinking earlier in the night, this connection, this intimacy. But later in the night, alcohol played a further role in consolidating friendship through uh, women looking after their friends. Um, so Donna says here, you know, you get to see people at your worst. If you can say to someone, oh, by the way, I dragged you home crying for an hour last night. There's not a lot they can do to shock you again. 
And she says, you know, it's not quite friendship building, but it's friendship cementing. Um, so this idea that caring for other women who were too drunk and looking after friends was another way of building intimacy and building trust. And this is really um, very clearly illustrated by another participant, Ali. Um, so Ali said, you know, the thing about drinking in the girls' night out is you have someone to hold your hair back when you're being sick. So this real gesture of care and intimacy through alcohol consumption. So there was also a sense that what women drink was important on the girls' night out as well. So Gail says, you know, if I go out with female friends, we drink together beforehand and we say, here's a bottle of wine, now let's sit and chat about our lives. So here, I would argue, the bottle of wine takes on a certain symbolism. The wine marks the transition to girl time and leisure time. Um, and again, in this quote from Gail, the importance of pre-drinking is illustrated. You know, it's about making a thing of drinking together beforehand. Um, and we know that for young women, particularly those in heterosexual relationships, they have less leisure time than young men. So for many of them, this girl time, this using alcohol with friends to get away from relationships and responsibilities was really important. There was also something specifically about drinking uh, wine and cocktails that tied into ideas around gender and class. So Megan says that she likes white wine and she says, you know, she kind of says in this quote, you know, I do like the taste, but really mostly what she's saying here is I like the way it looks. I feel nice with a glass of wine. It just seems a bit more elegant. So what, we, what I saw in my data was this linking into this idea that drinks like wine and cocktails are, as Leans and Willett argue, glamorous and sparkling. So these drinks, such as wine and cocktails, are feminine and classy, okay? So Megan describes the glass of wine as elegant. Uh, Joanna, another participant, said... She liked having a cocktail in a fancy glass as well. Um, so as Smith notes, the very vessels that we use for alcoholic beverages have become an important part of the experience. So the pleasures of drinking are material, but also symbolic. It's not just about how drinking affects our bodies, for example. It can be about how we use our drink to present certain kinds of gender specific identities. And my participants were very aware of this. Um, and they were aware that drinking together was also a way to do femininity collectively, but only if you drank what other women were drinking. So Eve says that she prefers to drink lager, but when she goes out with her female friends, she says, I feel like I have to become part of that identity. I feel like I'd, I'd be pushing them away if they asked if I wanted to share a bottle of wine. And I said, oh no, I'll go and get a lager. So here she feels an expectation to um, share wine with her female friends rather than drink beer. And Ali similarly said, I've made myself like wine. She would also rather have drunk uh, cider in this example. So women felt that they had to buy into this collective practice of sharing girly drinks with one another. In contrast then, building on intersections around gender and class, whilst wine and cocktails were both classy and feminine, other drinks were depicted simultaneously as manly and rough. Um, so here, Nicole says, women who drink pints is a bit manly, a bit rough. If you were well-to-do and middle-class, you just wouldn't do it. So here, there are associations with beer as masculine, but it's also about the pint glass. It's about the vessel in which the beer is consumed. So a pint glass being a quite a, lar a large measure um, in UK drinking, being about just over, um, just under 600 millilitres. So other participants said that drinking beer in a smaller glass would be less of a problem because women are supposed to be small and petite. However, one of the problems with the pint glass is that the sheer size of the pint uh, might suggest that you lack control over your drinking or that you're drinking with the intention to get very drunk. So wine and cocktails can be sipped or savoured, but beer could be chugged or downed, which means to drink very, very quickly. Um, so here, the problem with beer is not just its historical associations with masculinity, but also what it might signify in terms of drinking to get drunk. And here, Haley draws on examples of cider, 
um, certain cheap types of cider as also being problematic. She talks about a brand called Woodpecker and says proper scruffy Woodpecker cider. It's vile. It tastes absolutely horrendous. It just tastes like piss. So again, these ideas that um, drinking and class are bound up in particular ways in terms of what people drank. So consider, continuing our consideration of undoing Gurley then, it wasn't just, you know, how, how, how you, what you drank, sorry, and the glass that you drank it from, um, but it was also, you know, how much you drank and the effects that it had. So what's interesting is that my participants recognize that some degree of drunkenness is expected, normalized, or even, you know, encouraged on a night out. So letting your hair down, letting go, being drunk were seen as positive features of participating in nightlife. Um, however, there was always a line that should not be crossed here. Um, and young women may remain wary of being too loud or too visible in public space. So the risk for women is in making a spectacle of themselves in some ways. So the drunk female body was depicted by my participants as unattractive and unfeminine. And several participants talked about how the feminine body needs to remain ladylike or in control. So I asked Kimberly, you know, why do you, why do you say that it's, it's, not as, it's not feminine to be drunk? And she says, I think you lose control of yourself and you don't really care. You don't hold yourself together as much. Being feminine um, is about being respectable and being ladylike. And when, you, um, when you're drunk, that all goes out of the window. And Jade says, I think it looks bad when you see young girls that are not in control of themselves whatsoever crawling around the streets and being sick. So here, the drunken woman undermines the expectation that women should still maintain some control over their bodies, their behavior, and their appearance. The woman who is too drunk was often described as a state or a mess or not in control. And this was seen as a real problem, particularly when women were unable to stand up, unable to walk, or were being sick or urinating in public. So the last two examples of urinating and being sick in public are particularly interesting here. They represent a literal loss of control over the boundaries of the body if you're unable to avoid urinating or vomiting in public space. And these are particularly unfeminine as they take place in public. So Claire, one of my participants, describes being sick in a bin rather than being sick in a toilet as something that is particularly problematic. So there's something about the visible public displays of drunkenness that is seen here as problematic. So I wanted to now think about um, and link the, some of these ideas more explicitly with ideas of space and return to um, consideration of the big market. So as I said, whilst going out and clubbing could be positive and meaningful for young women, they recognise that there's still a line that you must not cross. Um, whilst letting go could be positive and normalised, they did not want to you know, be seen as too drunk or too out of control. So one strategy that my participants used to legitimize their own drinking um, was to associate particularly problematic drinking with this space, the big market. Um, so this links nicely with what Roxanne was talking about this morning as well around kind of space and emotional mapping around certain spaces having these negative associations. So almost all of my participants said that the big, big market was a part of town that they would avoid. They used terms such as cheap, rough, and nasty to talk about the big markets, um, and importantly, to talk about the types of women that they thought went out in the big market. So the big market was depicted by students, particularly, as a space frequented by older locals or Geordies. Um, and this, of course, was a veiled way of talking about social class. So for the student, middle class students, the big market was a working class space where both the performances of masculinity and femininity were problematic or inappropriate. So men in the big market were depicted as threatening and violent and risky, and women were depicted as excessive in the ways that they dress, but also their behavior. 
So they were depicted as drinking heavily, losing control and being loud. So as Alex says, I've never screamed down the street. When you see people that do that, it's mainly lower class people and start fights on the street. So she contrasts the kind of working class Geordie woman with her and her friends. She says, my friends and I would never fight on a night out. So this is interesting because of course, what, what do the women them who themselves identify as working class local Geordies do in these situations? Um, you know, the participants who themselves identify as Geordie um, also work to distance themselves from the spaces of the big market. So what was interesting in my data was working class Geordie women worked harder than anyone else to really express to me that they um, did, would never go out in the big market. They like to go out in the diamond strip, that classy upmarket area with cocktail bars. Um, for example, Kirsty, one of my Geordie participants, made a real point of saying, we are not those big market people. We would not go out there. It's not safe. Um, and it doesn't appeal to us. And we've been brought up to avoid it. Um, her sister, Nicole, also stated, a lot of people, I think, particularly down south, will look at us and think that we're like the people who go out down the big markets. Um, and I'm not being funny. You can tell a lot of them don't have jobs just from the way they're behaving, what they're dressed in. And then Nicole makes this fascinating point. She says, they're, you know, what we would call the underclass. They're all fighting and they're really drunk. So during her interview, Nicole made a real point of describing herself as a hardworking, down-to-earth Geordie woman. Um, and she contrasts this with this unemployed underclass who are characterized not just by the fact that they go to the big market, but by what they wear and by their drunken, aggressive behavior. So Nicole argues that she would avoid the big market at all costs. It's where you get trouble from Chavez. Chavez is a similar, used in a similar way to the underclass to think about, you know, this kind of negative working class identity. So here, what Nicole and other participants are doing is positioning themselves as part of what we might call the respectable wedge of the working class rather than the rough wedge of the working class. However, I also wanted to think just briefly um, about how um, alcohol consumption was used by some of my participants to challenge ideas about femininity and this idea that women should be constrained and controlled in particular ways. There was some evidence of challenge to femininity. So Haley says, I don't know what other people do on their nights out. We're really loud. We're really leery. She goes on to tell me about a song that she sings about uh, men's penises when, she sees, when her friends see them urinating on the streets and then laughs and says, I don't think that would be perceived as feminine. So we could argue here that what we are seeing is some resistance to these traditional scripts of femininity. So some behavior on a night out could be characterized by being rude, by being loud, by challenging femininity. Um, and interestingly, being drunk could also be um, a way for women to excuse certain types of behavior as well. So what I saw from the data was many women having this quite ambivalent relationship with femininity. And this is really illustrated by Ruth here. So Ruth says, you know, um, my group of friends, we're boyish. Um, and then she goes on to kind of retract that a little bit and say, well, we are girly. We do like to shop and do girly things, but we are very vulgar sometimes. Um, so some really girly girls, you can't say sarcastic comments to them. So what we see here and elsewhere in my data was this kind of simultaneous claiming of a girly identity, but rejecting the idea of being too girly. So being, you know, really girly or too girly was something that was belittled across the data in contrast to being fun and a bit loud and vulgar. Um, so some interesting examples starting to come through in the data here. But again, this raises questions about, you know, is this really empowering or liberating for women? Um, is drunkenness permitting kinds of different, different kinds of behavior? And are some women more able than others to adopt these kinds of more transgressive positions? So I just wanted to finish with a few additional thoughts. I thought I'd try to bring in some of my more recent research, as Jenny says, around um, sobriety and the experiences of women who stop drinking. 
So um, we know that historically, um, you know, obviously drinking has been positioned as unfeminine for women. And then we might see some evidence of women reclaiming um, or challenging femininity through drinking. However, in my research with women who stop drinking, what I've seen is women kind of confirming this idea that the drinking self is problematic and unfeminine. So they often positioned their past drinking self as obnoxious, as rude, as a bad partner or a bad mother, um, in contrast to the sober self who was seen as, you know, re-embodying these kinds of femininity. So the drinking self was positioned as losing control of their body, but also losing control over domestic space. So they often talked about the home being a mess or a state when they were still drinking. And then Isabel really shows here this idea that sobriety was about a return to more traditional femininity. So she says, you know, when I was drinking, I would never come home and cook. Um, and then she's talking here about her partner. She says, now I get so much pleasure coming home and cooking a meal for us both. Um, and she goes on to say, you know, I've been able to help someone else and improve their diet. And then she talks about the house being really clean. She says, I clean every Sunday. Every Sunday I do all my cleaning. I'm one of these really house proud people now. So sobriety here was about regaining control over the unruly feminine body or a return to kind of more domestic femininity. And I, I did want to flag up, we know that certainly in the UK and also more widely, drinking rates are actually in decline, particularly amongst young people. So it will be interesting to see you know, how much and in what ways young people in particular are trying to kind of give, give positive meaning to sobriety and non-drinking through drawing on these, these traditional kinds of narratives. Um, and I finally, I couldn't get away without, without not at least briefly mentioning the pandemic and starting to think about, you know, how might drinking and femininity and gender and class be, be configured in different ways under um, COVID-19 and lockdown. So um, my more recent research has looked at women's experience, well, and men's experiences of drinking during lockdown. There was definitely a sense in my data um, that for older women, particularly for mothers, much of their drinking had already shifted to the home space, especially when they had children. So we know that domestic drinking is um, a really important part of many people's lives and it's increasing considerably. And for many of my participants, clubbing and even going out drinking in bars and clubs might be much less frequent occurrences than previously. So it was more difficult for some of the younger women that I spoke to, um, perhaps, um, and they did miss drinking and clubbing. They saw it as part of their identity, but they might be carving out these creative new ways to create drinking spaces. So Jess and Lucy, who took part in a focus group with me, talked about turning their garden shed into a bar. Um, and they say here, you know, before it had a lawnmower, bikes, um, boxes in it. Um, and then what they did is they kind of turned it into this drinking space. They put fairy lights in um, and it's a space where they would go play loud music and drink shots of tequila. So this kind of playful and creative, you know, establishment of drinking spaces that sit just, you know, within but slightly outside of the domestic space. So just to try and pull everything together that we've talked about, um, certainly something that's come through a lot in my research is the idea that feminine drinks allow women to carve out girl time, um, whilst drinking and drunkenness provide opportunities for women to do friendships um, and intimacy and trust. And intersections of girly and classy are important here. So certain drinks are not just kind of, not just girly, but actually seen as upmarket or classy or elegant or sophisticated in contrast to other drink choices and practices. So interestingly, my participants really confined unfeminine drinking and practices to certain risky spaces um, and venues. And this worked in particular class ways. So they depicted certain drinks and certain part of towns as parts of town as rough. Um, and this was very much shaped by social class, by middle class students, you know, belittling uh, working class Geordie women and working class Geordie women talking about the chava or the underclass in these spaces. And as I touched on, these unfeminine practices could sometimes be embraced. Um, and, this, and you had to kind of balance this idea between being the kind of boyish kind of figure and being the really girly girl. 
And then just a couple of questions to finish on, you know, with drinking in decline, how might this be impacting on performances of femininity and female friendship and the ways that drinking and non-drinking identities are constructed? And then big question, probably hard to answer, but how has the pandemic also changed opportunities to do femininity and friendship? And what will women's drinking and clubbing look like in a post COVID world? Thank you. Well, yes, thank you very much for the inspiring talk. Um, I think there will be many questions. I see a lot of clapping hands for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, Sage. Hi, um, that was that was super interesting and really fun to listen to, um, not only but also because it brought me back to many, many different spaces in my own life. Um, and the thing I wanted to ask a question about this weird thing that I've noticed lately in American English. I don't know, and I wonder if it's true in British English as well. Mm -hmm. um, where people talk about having wine, like like women, like as opposed to drinking wine, you know, like it's something that I've noticed even in my own friend groups, like mm -hmm. um, let's get together and have wine and, or like we were having wine and X and like it, it sort of bothers me because it's not, it's not, it, I, it bothers me enough that I noticed it finally. And like, mm -hmm. it, I'm wondering in the context of what you're saying, it's like, I don't know, on some level, it's sort of a, um, you know, a distancing yourself from, from the drinking of wine as, as if you might be sitting around with a bottle of wine on the table, you know, unopened mm -hmm. and un, unconsumed. And if this is something you've noticed and if you have anything, any thoughts about that. Yeah, um, that's really interesting. I'm not sure if that exact language has caught on in um, in British English, British English, yeah, British English. I think that, but I think that what you're saying is is true. I think that there might be something there about recognizing drinking historically as a masculine practice and being able to distance oneself from the act of consumption. Um, I mean, to me, the idea of having wine in that context strikes me as trying to position it as more, more about the, the wine and what's going on around it rather than drinking wine to get drunk, for example. Um, and certainly I think that did come through in my data, you know, with the idea that here's a bottle of wine, now let's sit and talk about our lives, as Gail said. So I think there was work going on there to position wine consumption as something more than just drinking, you know, for the pleasure, you know, the pleasure of drinking or the pleasure of getting drunk was part of it but it was this bigger narrative of I think you're right you know of having wine and getting together girl time and I think that certainly marketing and advertising in the UK has really caught on to that as well I think the way that wine is advertised is about having some girl time or you know taking a moment to yourself or even problematically managing the stresses of motherhood through taking some time out to drink wine so yeah I think that's I think that's definitely even if that language isn't being used per se I think that practice of positioning wine as part of something bigger is definitely there any further questions I clearly have um, at least one. <laughs> um, I was really curious because you 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 mentioned several times that they that the the pre drinking was really the the important part. And I and since you mentioned space, I was wondering what's what sort of the added value of them actually going out in the spaces <laughs> maybe. Yeah, so, and actually some of them did say that the pre-drinking is the, the, their favorite part of the nights and the best part of the nights. Um, and, you know, as I touched on, it has value in terms of the intimacy, the bonding. Um, I think probably part of the value of going out was the girls' night out is also about uh, producing a certain type of feminine body. There's a very heteronormative expectation of what your body looks like on a girls' night out. So, you know, along with the pre-drinking, there was often a lengthy process of doing hair, doing makeup, getting ready. So in a way, the night out represented an opportunity to take that beyond the domestic space maybe you know and some participants 
of course, some of them talked about, and many of them talked about negative experiences of being looked at, experiencing harassment, experiencing um, sexual violence. But they also sometimes did talk about the pleasures of being visible, of being seen, of being in public space. So I think there was some value in the night out in that sense. And also um, dancing as well. So some of them talked about really enjoying going out into a club space and drinking and dancing. So I think that there was something valuable about both the pre-drinking and the night out. And they gave the women slightly different things, I think. Gemma? Um, yes, thank you, uh, Emily, for a wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, I enjoyed it so much. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more about the sort of the deeper value of this girls' night out. I mean, you mentioned a bottle of wine and then talking our lives through together. Um, but why not uh, join in with men? And what was the value of the women being amongst each other? And uh, you mentioned uh, talking about motherhood. I mean, were there had particular social changes perhaps that uh, that you think can be related to growing needs for girls night out or mm -hmm. uh, I mean obviously it's kind of a universal thing but um, probably also maybe uh, time related or uh, in specific periods of time perhaps people uh, drift toward it more what, what did they talk about uh, around the bottle yeah I think that's that's a really interesting question and I think you know, as I touched on in the slides as well, particularly for um, the straight young women, and certainly again in my study as well, who were in relationships, um, they're often leisure to, women's leisure time is kind of subsumed and lost um, when they're in a heterosexual relationship or at least reduced. So one of the values of the girls' night out was a space away from that male partner to kind of, to, to rant and vent and to, you know, complain about the stresses or the difficulties of the relationship. Um, so that was a particular value, certainly for, for many of my participants who identified as straight. I think as well, there was a sense amongst some participants, particularly amongst the working class women, um, some of them talked about you know, you don't have a lot of money, you don't want to say you can't save up for something big, some big holiday, something fancy. So the girls night out becomes this weekly way of having time out of having time to yourself, having time with the girls, this escape from work and, and work was generally positioned either as something really boring and mundane, or something really stressful. So particularly for um, the young working class women who worked full time, this idea that the girls night out was this this thing that was built up throughout the week, and it was the Friday or the Saturday, um, and that it offered this escape from the kind of mundane realities of everyday life, and um, perhaps less so from many of the students who might go out you know four times a week didn't always go out on a weekend usually went out in the week um, and they did they did also talk about going out with male friends going out with partners but I think there was still something specific in girl time that they valued um, and something about it being the girls night out it was you know some of them talked about going out for dinner or going to the cinema but there was something specific about the drinking with female friends um, I think it also linked into age a little bit as well. So obviously my participants were all under 25, but they talked about getting older, having more responsibilities, and it became a way, almost a way to relive some of that, the carefree youth. I mean, they still were youth, but, you know, the youth of being sort of 16, 17, 18. So, you know, they talked about friends getting married and having children. And again, it seems that the girls' night out was, was a permitted way. You know, it was a way that was seen as socially acceptable for them to have that time out from those responsibilities. So so it definitely did seem to hold a specific value to them. Thanks. Any more questions? I mean, I would be really interested in, in the role of, uh, you, you mentioned that already, in the role of sexuality in this whole game. That that was a tiny bit also, my question was directed to that, although I, I vaguely remember that um, most literature says that, um, and I think you too, that, that people 
that women don't go out to to find sexual partners or that mm -hmm. at least they don't state it <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah yeah definitely so um none of them talked about pulling as we might call it in the uk or you know going out to find a sexual partner um However, I think there was a sense that the girls' night out in particular was not about going out and meeting a partner because the girls' night out, you, you start the night and you finish the night with the same group of female friends. So it would almost be seen as um, not playing your part in the girls' night out if you used it to try and like pull or hook up with someone. But as you suggest, it might just be that they didn't want, there was some hesitation about talking about the, to those kinds of practices but yeah it was very much there might be some pleasure in getting looked at or getting a bit of attention but it was generally not seen as the kind of space for for those kinds of activities but I wonder as well if with with for example so much dating practices shifting online there is so much less of an expectation for young people to go out and and meet someone on a night out um but yeah, I would definitely say that, it, that this was seen as something separate to, you know, seeking any kind of like, you know, sexual partner or hooking up with anyone. Okay, I'm seeing that there's something in the chat. Okay, just thank yous. Um, I think it's getting late, ah, Frederike. I think I just I wanted to add something because what Jenny just said, the sexuality, of course, I think this uh, girls' night out is not the place to go out and pull guys. <laughs> but I think, especially in this pre-drinking um, setting, I think that female sexuality does have a part in that because this is, I would think, uh, the place where female sexuality is debated or negotiated in this group of girls where you talk about female sexuality, something that you don't uh, talk about in a group of that with um, where there are males or something like that. Do you think that this is um, something that, or did the women express that this was something that, because there was this um, one thing, the Lambrini uh, mm -hmm. ad that you showed us that says he wanted us to get a pet, yes. but I've all got, already got a rabbit, which is also th <laughs> something that I think should speak to this vulgar uh, talk that uh, women have together when they drink mm -hmm. Lambrini, when they pre-drink Lambrini or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's great that you picked up on that. I did, I thought, I was like, I won't have the time to go into it, but yeah, the, with thinking with the Lambrini advert, it was um, referring to the idea of, you know, my, part, my straight partner wants us to get a pet, but I've already got a, a, a vibrating sex toy, basically. So yeah, I think that's a really good example of the, the idea or the expectation of, of what might be talked about. And I think, you know, they did, they did say that they did say that they talked about these more, you know, they might talk about sex and relationships and more intimate values with female friends. They talked about lowering inhibitions, about feeling more comfortable talking about things you wouldn't normally talk about. So I absolutely think it was probably a space for that kind of talk. But also I think what's interesting is the kind of visual displays of, of heteronormativity that were worked on in that pre-drinking space as well. So some of my participants talked about coming downstairs wearing a pair of jeans and being sent back upstairs to get changed into something more girly. Um, so there was, and there were elements of policing um, each other's bodies and of, you know, working together to present this kind of very, very white heteronormative visual femininity that was very much about emphasizing you know, certain parts of the body, the hair, the eyelashes, emphasizing either your breasts or your bum, but never both. So there was definitely, I think, in terms of sexuality, I guess it comes into it there as well, this working together to police uh, the bodies of others to make sure they were all presenting this, this acceptable form of femininity, which of course is also what you need to be let into venues even in these mainstream spaces. So they had to negotiate those kinds of visual displays of sexuality as well, regardless of, you know, regardless of their own sexuality. So many of my participants who weren't straight would still be expected to kind of embody these particular these norms of, of ways of presenting the body if they were going to go out in mainstream spaces. Stefan, you had a question? 
Yeah, thanks, Emily. Uh, that's really great. Uh, so, like I had some connection problems, um, so I apologize if you already uh, spoke to that. But I'm interested if there's is there a moral panic discourse around this in the sense of that you know these women you know they have to be protected or you know or, or they um, someone else has to be protected like um, mm -hmm. and who like who do they uh, have to be protected from. And if there's this moral discourse um, or moral panic discourse, did it change in the last 20 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a great question. And I think it links really nicely to Gemma's presentation as well. You know, it's as if every time it's something new, you know, whether it's 1920s, whether it's the 1990s, or whether it's, you know, my research in 2012, I think there always seems to be some kind of moral panic and social anxiety around women's drinking, uh, women's public drinking in particular. So I think whereas, you know, with um, with Gemma's example, it might have been more kind of some feminist anxieties as well around women's kind of um, kind of public displays of drinking and this kind of problematic performances of femininity. I think that there's certainly also evidence of this in, in UK examples. So particularly in the UK, examples of, you know, whenever there's media sensationalizing about problem drinking it, the face of it is usually the young binge drinking woman um there's a, often a fixation upon the image of the kind of scantily clad woman on a night out not wearing very much so i think i think you're absolutely right i think a lot of this panic is around um around young women i think in the 90s in the uk there was a, a real panic around uh, the ladette I don't know if the term ladette translates across um, into other contexts, but the ladette was was the this figure in the 90s who was seen as really embodying that kind of boyish, vulgar, you know, she might be the one to make the joke about having a rabbit already. She was this, this sassy kind of girl power up for it kind of um, young woman that might chug beer in the pub um, to the point that a, a British TV show was was made called From Ladette to Lady, in which a number of binge drinking ladettes were taken off to this country house to learn how to be a lady. Um, so they were taken away from their pub environment um, and they were and they were coached in how to be heterosexually, uh, you know, heterosexually attractive, desirable and classy um, to men. So I think that. Yeah, I think the answer is that it's kind of always there, but the manifestation of it is slightly different. Um, and with young people now drinking less um, and with, you know, the pandemic kind of potentially changing some of the ways that we socialize, the ways that we go clubbing and drinking, it will be interesting to see how the next stage, perhaps the next stage of the panic is around this mum, mummy drinking, this kind of mummy wine culture. Um, I think there's definitely something coming through there as well. So I think, yeah, I think it's always there. It just takes a slightly different form across different times and across different contexts. Melina? Thank you, Emily, for this very interesting uh, speech and, and all this um, stories about the city and its geography, this social and class geography linked to um, having a night out. Uh, I have a question about um, the last uh, examples and slides you showed about sobriety. Mm -hmm. It seems um, that sobriety is linked for uh, your, the, the people you met um, with um, to be a um, housewife to the, 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 the private space of the home and uh, to have this perfect role of being a carer for uh, her partner mm -hmm. who does absolutely have nothing to do <laughs> the partner in order to feed himself or uh, tidy the house or anything like that. And um, I have a question about places uh, for sobriety in, in the night out. Mm -hmm. Um, if you met some people who uh, are sober, might be sober, might enjoy some moment of uh, uh, not drinking the whole night, um, or if sobriety is really, really tied to the um, um, private place of the home. Yeah, thanks, Melina. That's a really good question. And I think that example that I showed from Isabel, it's 
it is quite an extreme but very interesting example with this literally embodying as you say the housewife figure and a lot of them talked about as i said reclaiming the domestic space about having you know their home was tidy they'd started cooking they were much better mothers they were much better wives so there was definitely that association of sobriety with the domestic sphere um at the same time a lot of the women who stopped drinking that i spoke to said that they they didn't want things to change they still wanted to be able to go on a night out with female friends or to go to the pub um, so i would say many of them still did go out and participate in those kinds of spaces um, but they they positioned their participation in those spaces differently so they would say um one thing they really drew on was um, being a more being more authentic being more real in these spaces so going drinking and clubbing and not have not having like a mask on some of them talked about you know hiding behind alcohol or beer or, or drinking and this idea that they they that the true self wasn't really participating in nights out before because they'd been drinking so yeah they definitely did talk about still going out and being this more more genuine more authentic person and i think as well that ties into these kinds of neoliberal ideas of this the construction of the kind of authentic productive sober self um so yeah i think they did but i think they also want because as well because sobriety can be stigmatized that might explain why they worked quite hard to tell me what what goods what good feminine women they were now that they'd stopped drinking i may have a question maybe uh, i was wondering did you notice uh differences about gender strategies and gender um feelings uh, according to the the festive places maybe uh, you, you mentioned club clubs you mentioned bars but uh, did you heard maybe about like alternative parties like rave parties free parties all of that after house uh, a rave and um, mm -hmm. they say uh, to you about it if they did yeah i guess in a way i i was like lo i loaded the research in a way because i I said, you know, tell me about the girls' night out. So a lot of them mainly focused on that main, those mainstream spaces. So the girls' night out was really about going out in this very heteronormative context and going to those bars and clubs. Um, however, some of them did did talk about um, how they liked going to alternative venues in the city. So um, Newcastle does not have a big rave scene or underground clubbing scene, or if it does, I, I certainly don't know about it. Um, but they did, they sometimes talked about, you know, like that they went to rock bars or, um, you know, more like dive bars that might have, you know, be dark and dingy with sticky floors. Um, so there were, some examples where they um they preferred to go out in these alternative kinds of spaces um, and some of them said that they felt that there was less harassment in these spaces as well so less less of an expectation that men and women would behave in particular kind of gendered normative ways in their in those alternative venues um also um a lot of my participants went out on the gay scene so newcastle has a small gay scene again they talked about that being a space that was really free from the male gaze really free from feeling policed or feeling harassed by others um, however, on the girls' night out, it just seemed that you had to you had to buckle up and and go to the mainstream spaces, even if you preferred to go to those to those alternative venues. Usually, thank you. Well, thank thank you so much for having me, and thank you for for the questions. It's been great. Thank you.